Hey there to my Facebook audience. <clears throat> Hoping Periscope can come in. I should already be on Periscope, but I'm trying to make sure the camera flips so you can see me. And there we go. All right. Well, welcome to Second Thursday Night NMG with PDT. That's me, Prophet David Taylor. And uh, so i uh, got a lot of stuff to do, got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. So let's jump on in. Let's start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, God, for this night. Thank you for this teaching. Thank you for my audience. Thank you for an opportunity, O oh Lord, to be used by you. I ask you, I invite you in. I invoke you, O oh God. I praise your name. I give you glory. I give you the honor that to do your name, O oh God, because your name is worthy of praise at all times and in all situations. I invite you into this broadcast tonight, O oh God. I ask you to use me and help me to give to the body of Christ what you've given to me and uh, help deliver it with clarity and emphasis and uh, use it to your glory and for the edification of the body. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so a few things I need to talk about first before we dive into tonight's lesson. Thing number one, uh, I've been asked many times, how can you support me? All right, and so uh, first way you can support me is through my PayPal link. So I've got a PayPal Me account set up. Now my uh, company is 501c3. Uh, it's an NFP, a not-for-profit. So when you give donations to Profit David Taylor, they are tax deductible. So you can do that through my PayPal Me link. So uh, I put the PayPal Me link on my Twitter feed. My Twitter is PDT. SOTC. Okay? PDT SOTC. My PayPal link will be there. Um, also, it is now on my Periscope profile. It's on my Periscope profile. So when you look me up on Periscope uh, at the top of my profile, when you say it, when it says about, my PayPal link is there. And then also I will put it on all of my uh, Facebook Live videos. I'll put, put my PayPal link there along with the title. <clears throat> So there's that way. Second way you support you can support me is by supporting my music. I have a whole music ministry I do, and that's called Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. Now, what I do believe I'm going to do there is I'm going to set up a Patreon uh, for videos. I have so much music. I have music out there, and I have so much more music I'm going to put out there. Uh, but I definitely want uh, direct fan support, so I'm obviously going to put stuff on iTunes and YouTube and all that, but I definitely want some direct supports from, from the fans. So once I get that set up, I'll be sure to mention that to you and be sure to give you links to my Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross Patreon where you can get uh, behind the scenes videos, you can get making of stuff. You, I'm going to be talking about help for songwriters and producers. And uh, so there's going to be a lot you get when you support uh, the Patreon. So that's the two ways you can support me because, again, I've been asked that. So my PayPal link and those donations are tax deductible. And then I'm going to be setting up a Patreon for my Shades of the Cross band. Okay. Now, how and where to find me. I always hashtag everything I do with the hashtag PDT, standing for Prophet David Taylor. So that's the easiest way to find me on any kind of social media, from YouTube to, to LinkedIn to Facebook, Twitter, just look up the hashtag PDT, Prophet David Taylor. That's the fastest way to find me online. Okay? Now, my regular broadcast is Sunday afternoons at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. <clears throat> That's Sunday afternoon, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm on Facebook Live and Periscope, just like I am now, with a live prophetic word and prophetic teaching. Now, on second Thursday nights, which is tonight... I do a very specific teaching called No More Genies. And that's always hashtagged with hashtag NMG for No More Genies, okay? And when I say No More Genies, what I'm talking about is No More Genie Concept of God. The genie concept of God has messed up a lot of people. It's messed up a lot of unbelievers. It's messed up a lot of believers. Some people have gotten themselves in a whole lot of trouble because of genie concept, some people have lost their children. Some people have even lost their very lives because of a wrong concept of God, because of genie concept, thinking of God as a genie. 
So this teaching that I'm doing tonight is my third teaching in this series. I only come on once a month with, with this teaching, okay? So I come on the second Thursday of every month with this teaching called, again, hashtag NMG, No More Genies, okay? So I've got two other uh, teachings, so if you want to check those out, and I strongly suggest that you do, um, you can look up the hashtag NMG on my Facebook page or on my Periscope or on my Twitter account, and you can find my other teachings on No More Genies. Now, <clears throat> my, uh, my Periscope handle is uh, PDTSOTC, just like my Twitter. My Twitter is PDTSOTC, stands for Prophet David Taylor. And then on Facebook, my if you want to look that page up, it's actually DT2 Prophet David Taylor. Okay, DT2 Prophet David Taylor. And I do that because there's other ministers out there named David Taylor. I just want people to know that it's me. Okay, but again, the hashtag's are always the way to go. That's the fastest way to find me. Hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG. Okay. All right, so now we're going to dive into tonight's lesson. I'm going to start off something. We're still talking about the no more genie concept. I'm going to start dealing with common misconceptions. I'm going to start dealing with very common misconceptions that people have in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ, in our church backgrounds, and many times even with secular people, even people in the world, even people that don't have any particular religious affiliation, or training, they have some ideas that are just wrong. And like I said, when you've got the wrong concept of God, when you've got genie concept, it can severely mess you up. And it messes up quite a bit of people. So we're going to start dealing with common misconceptions. So I'm going to deal with one misconception tonight. Okay, There are many that I'm going to deal with, but I'm only going to, going to address one tonight. Okay, The one I'm going to address tonight... <clears throat> is called the 30, 60, 100-fold mistake. The 30, 60, 100-fold mistake. Those of you that are familiar with the scripture, you already know what I'm talking about. And those of you that aren't, then I'm going to explain it to you as we go. Okay? Now, there's a couple things I want to throw in before we dive into the meat of that message. The first thing I want to throw in is I'll, I want to give you my test from the Bible as a prophet. Okay? Many times people are wonder, wondering about, like, how do you know if a message is from God or not? Okay, that's legit. That's a legit question. That's how so much abuse happens, okay? You don't have to believe what somebody says just because they start talking. And just because they give themselves a title or, what, excuse me, whatever, that's not how it works. There are tests in the Bible for every one of the fivefold ministry gifts, if you didn't know that. There are tests for apostles, there are tests for prophets, there are tests for evangelists, there are tests for pastors, and there are tests for teachers. There are tests for bishops, there are tests for deacons, there are tests for elders, okay? So for every one of the offices or positions or stations listed in the Bible in terms of Christian leadership, there are tests, there are tests. Okay, so I'm going to give you my test as a prophet. And those of you that aren't familiar with the prophetic or those of you that don't believe in the prophetic or you think it's just a scam or you think it's just a sham or you think I'm crazy. You think there's no such thing as prophets that, you know, prophetic doesn't work. That's just a bunch of crazies or whatever you think. I'm going to give you the test from the scripture. And here it is. It's Deuteronomy. That's the fourth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, fourth book in the Bible from the beginning, is part of what the Jewish people call the Torah, what the Gentiles call the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. It was written by Moses. Deuteronomy, fourth book in the Bible, from the top, in the Old Testament, from the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deut uh, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, I'm sorry. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so it's the fifth. I'm sorry, I said it was the fourth, it's the fifth, I'm sorry made a mistake. But uh, anyway, fifth book, uh, after Numbers, <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, and here it is. It says, 
When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the message does not come to pass or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Now, how much more plain can you make that? Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, so somebody comes to you in the name of God, and the message does not come to pass or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, do not be afraid of him. Okay? Now, that's the NIV translation. Okay? So... That's about as plain as you can make it. So the test of a prophet, if somebody's coming to you, saying to you that they're bringing something to you in the name of God, the, the Bible says if they're speaking in the name of God, it has, to come, it has to come to pass or it has to come true. And if it doesn't, it's a message that the Lord hasn't spoken. Boom. There it is. So you never have to wonder about the veracity of a prophetic message again. Okay, you never have to wonder about it again. Because the Lord says, if somebody comes to you speaking to you in my name, if it doesn't come to pass, if it doesn't come true, the God says that's not a message from me. Okay, that that prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. There it is. I got no problem with my test. I got no problem with you testing me. Okay, because I'm not out here on my own. I'm not out here by myself. I'm not out here because I called myself, regardless of what people might say. So anything I take, you take it, you test it. You test it. See if it comes to pass. See if it's true. You test it. I got no problem with that. Okay, so that's my test as a prophet. So again, uh, 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 I did that wrong. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy is, Deuteronomy is actually the fifth book. Fifth book from the top in the Old Testament, part of the Pentateuch, written by Moses uh, in the Bible. So just want to make sure I got that right because I uh, uh, made a mistake there. But anyway, Deuteronomy 18.22, that's where that verse is. So that's where you find that test. So I've got no problem with my test. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, the second thing I want to throw out there is I have a couple of Bible study videos, how to study the Bible. So uh, I'll put them again on my Twitter link and I'll put them on my Facebook page because I go into the principles of how to do Bible study. OK, very, very important. There are, are five basic principles, but I want you to watch the video so you know how to study the Bible uh, for yourself. Uh, very, very important that you study the scriptures for yourself, because a lot of people say, well, I don't understand the Bible and I don't understand how it's written and blah, 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 blah. You can study the scriptures for yourself. And you can understand it uh, for yourself. Okay? All right. So now we're going to dive in to our lesson tonight. And our lesson tonight is 30, 60, 100-fold mistake. Okay? 30, 60, 100-fold mistake. Now, <clears throat> in the Bible, uh, what we've called that is the parable of the sower, where Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower. That is found in three places in the New Testament. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? So we're going to read that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the parable of the sower, where the Lord talks about, where he uses the phrase about the 30, 60, 100 fold, okay? So we're going to be reading out of the NIV. Uh, so first we're going to start off with Matthew chapter 13. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Okay? Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Now, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Okay? Yeah, now I got that right. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay? So, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, 
and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Matthew 13, 1 through 8. Next, <clears throat> we're going to read that same uh, story in Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. So Mark is the second book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. So we're going to read out of Mark, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred times. Okay? Now we're going to read that same parable one more time in the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke is the third book in the New Testament. Okay? We're going to read Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he had said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay? All right, now we read the same parable three times in three different books of the Bible. Once in Matthew, once in Mark, and once in Luke. All the NIV versions. And that's called the parable of the sower. Okay? So Jesus was trying to give them some teachings, but he taught, them, uh, taught it to them in parables. If you don't know what a parable is, a parable is a story that illustrates a point or several points. So he told it to them in story form, that's why it's called the parable of the sower. It's a story that's illustrating the points that the Lord is trying to make about how the kingdom of God works. Okay? So, let's get a breakdown of what the Lord was actually talking about in that parable, in that story. Let's get a breakdown in Jesus' own words. Okay? And to do that, we're going to go back again to the scripture and read later on in those same chapters where the Lord explains to his disciples what he meant by the parable of the, of the sower, what he meant by that story. So let's go to Matthew 13, and we're going to read verses 18 through 23. So we're back in Matthew now. We're going to read Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 18 through 23. Okay? Here we go. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 18, 18 through 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, 
they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Now right there you have the Lord breaking down the story for you. Let's read that again in Mark chapter 4. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 4 verses 13 through 20. Mark chapter 4, verses 13 through 20. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path when the, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word, and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown, sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Okay, that's Mark, and now we're going to go to Luke's version. We're going to go back to Luke chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 11 through 15. Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. And again, we're listening to Jesus himself break down the, his own teaching on the parable of the sower. Luke 8, 11 through 15. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word of God with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay? So, let's deal with some of the most common mistakes that people get out of that teaching. Okay? So, one of the first mistakes we're going to deal with is how people think that that teaching means it's like a slot machine. <laughs> like, you ought to be able to put something in and then pull the lever, and then you, you put in one coin, and you're going to get 30 coins back out. And it's going to happen that way if you get lucky, or it's going to happen that way every time. Or you put a coin in, and you pull the machine, you're supposed to get 60 coins out if you hit the jackpot, or... Uh, I've heard it taught to where it's like, you know, it's, uh, you know, the word of God can't be broken and it's guaranteed. So if you do this, if you put in a dollar, then God's going to give you back $60. Or if you put in a dollar, God's going to give you back $30. Or if you put in a dollar, God's going to give you back $100. Okay? And that, you know, and it has to happen that way. So first mistake that people make is reading that thinking it's like a slot machine. It's not a slot machine. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Okay? I'm going to show you how it does work in a minute, but I want to deal with the mistakes. I want to deal with the stuff that we have in our heads that are wrong, okay? So mistake number one is not a slot machine, okay? It doesn't work that way. Here we go. It's, uh, mistake number two. 
Mistake number two is you are expecting manna. You think that your harvest, your return, your 30, 60, 100 fold, it's just going to fall out the sky. You're just going to be walking along, do 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 and boom, that return falls out the sky. Lord have mercy, that's not the truth. Okay? James 2, 14 through 26 talks about how you have to add works to your faith. James chapter 2 is in the New Testament. The book of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 talks about you have to add uh, works to your faith. That's where you find that famous verse, faith without works is dead. James spends all those verses talking about how you got to add some works to your faith. In other words, you got to do something. you got to put some effort in. There has to be some corresponding action on your part to go along with what you're believing. Okay? So let me put that in practical terms. You can walk out in your backyard, lean over to your little garden patch, and say to the ground, give me some tomatoes. And you can go out there every day and say to the ground, give me some tomatoes. And you can go out there every day and say to the ground, give me some tomatoes. The ground is just going to smile at you and the ground going to say, don't bring me your need, bring me some seed. <laughs> now, I got that from the late, great Jim Rohn. I want to give him credit. That's not original. I, I didn't come up with that. Jim Rohn said that. I got that from him. But I think it's apropos here and I think it's powerful. Um, because the ground is not going to give you tomatoes just because you say it. Confession is a part of uh, activating your faith, but you got to get out there and work the garden and, and plant the seeds in the soil, and you got to do all that if you want some tomatoes. See what I mean? It's not a slot machine, but it's not manna. And I've seen it taught that way, and I've seen a lot of people expect that to happen. So you put an offering in church, and you thought that somehow when you went home, there was going to be like this shower of dollar bills in your house. So you went and, and turned on the faucet, and instead of water coming out, dollar bills started coming out. And you went to jump in the shower, and you turned on the shower, and instead of water coming out, five dollar bills came out. That's not, no. It's not manna. It's a harvest. Okay, it's a crop. That means you got to put in some work. That means you got to do something to harvest it. It's not manna. Okay? All right. <clears throat> uh, let's deal with another mistake. Another mistake that uh, I've heard people get into is favoritism. Favoritism. Favoritism is where you come to an erroneous conclusion where you think that God plays favorites, that somehow God has favorites, that God has uh, just played favorites, okay? Now, that's a very broad subject because I know there's verses in the Bible where it says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I loved less in English. That's another conversation we got to get behind the English there. And I know there's places in the Bible where, where some people were blessed and some people were cursed and all that. So I know that can be confusing. So I may do a whole separate teaching just on favoritism alone. Because there is no respect of persons with God. you got the same God the Father. you got the same God the Son, Jesus. you got the same blood of Jesus. you got the same name of Jesus. you got the same Holy Ghost. you got the same Scripture. you got 24 hours. you got the same dirt. There's no respect of persons with God. There's no favoritism. Okay? God opens his hand. He gives us his word, his spirit, his blood, his love, his grace. Okay? There's no favoritism with God. In fact, the, the phrase that God is no respecter of persons or there is no respecter of persons with God, you know where that is in the Bible? That's in Romans 2.11. That's in Acts 10.34. That's in Colossians 3.25. That's in Ephesians 6.9. That's in 2 Chronicles 19 and 7, that's in 1 Peter 1.17, and that's in Deuteronomy 10.17. 
No respect of persons with God. It's in the Bible multiple times in both Testaments. There's no respect of persons with God. So sometimes what people do is they look at life and they think that God is playing favorites. That's the wrong conclusion. That is not the truth because the Bible says very clearly there's no respect of persons with God. And you got the same Father, the same Savior, the same blood of Jesus, the same name of Jesus, the same Holy Ghost, the same scriptures, 24 hours in your day, dirt on the ground, seeds, water, you know, rain, time, sunshine. He opened his hand and gave us all those things. Okay, so let's review our mistakes. First mistake is if you think it's a slot machine. If you think that I put a dollar in, cha-ching, I'm supposed to get $30 back. I put a dollar in, cha-ching, where's my $60? Put a dollar in, cha-ching, where's my $100? It's not a slot machine. Okay? Second mistake is if you expect it to be manna, you expect it to just fall out the sky where you don't have to do anything. That's tantamount to you going to your backyard, bending over, looking at the ground, saying, give me some tomatoes. You can yell at the ground all you want to. Ground ain't coming off no tomatoes just because you yell at it. Ground going to smile at you and say, don't bring me your need. Bring me some seed. You got to put some works behind your faith. Okay? And next one is favoritism. Trying to say that God somehow is playing favorites. That somehow he's more willing to bless certain people than he's willing to bless you. Okay? All of those are mistakes. All of that is not true. Okay? So, let's look at what is true. Let's look at what is true, okay? And the clues on how to practically interpret that scripture and the clues as to what that really means are found in the scripture itself. But I'm going to give you the principle and then we're going to look at the scripture. The key to your 30 60 or 100 fold return is your level of development. Good, googly muggly. <laughs> What'd you say, Prophet Taylor? What I said was the key to your 30, 60, and 100 uh, fold return is your level of development, is you. Really? Yes, really. And I'm going to show you how. And all of the, the clues that you need are right in the scriptures. So let's go back to, let me start with, uh, we're going to look at all three, just like we read all three. Let me start in Luke, go back to chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. Let's start there. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Stop. What did the Lord just say? He said it was seed. He said the seed is the word of God. How do seeds work? Seeds work by, when you get the seed, the seed is full of potential. But it is unrealized potential as long as it stays in seed form. Good googly muggly. I could do a whole hour just on that. Do you see what the Lord just said? He said the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. And again, we'll say it again. How do seeds work? Seeds have enormous potential, but it's unrealized potential while it's still in seed form. So the Lord just told us when he sows the word in our hearts, it has enormous potential. But that potential is going to remain unrealized as long as it stays in seed form. He just told you that. That's why it's not a slot machine. That's why it's not manna. That's why he's not playing favorites. He told you it comes like a seed. 
It comes with enormous potential. But the potential will remain unrealized if it stays in seed form. Okay? Then what does the Lord say next? The Lord says next, very, very clearly, that there are four different reactions that people have to the seed sown. Stop. <laughs> the Lord just told you everybody ain't going to react the same way. That means the problem is not with the seed. Whenever you hear people say stuff like, well, the Bible don't work. Problem's not with the seed. The problem is always, uh, the problem, the challenge, and the difference is always in the reaction of the people that hear it. It's in the reaction of the people that hear it. The problem is not in the seed because the Lord told you there are four different groups of people. Does, doesn't that show you how God is not playing favorites? How can you say that God is playing favorites when the Lord told you, when he told you this parable, that people react in four different ways? People react in four different ways. Let me say that one more time. People react in four different ways. How can you say that God is playing favorites when people are free to react any kind of way they want to? Let's look at those reactions, and let's look at the results. Uh, I'm in Mark chapter 4, verse 15. The Lord says, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Let's read that same thing in Matthew. Matthew 13 uh, uh, yeah, Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. Ah, what does that mean? That means I have to prepare my heart to receive God's word. If your heart is full, if you look like this on the inside, mm, <laughs> your heart is full of rebellion and resistance, and unbelief. Your heart is not prepared to receive the word of God. That's you. That's not God. That's your heart. Closed up, balled up like a fist. That's your heart. That's why the Bible speaks against hardness of heart. Okay? And it says, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. God gave you the same chance he gave everybody else. He put his word in seed potential form in your heart, and the Bible says there, the devil came and snatched it right out. Your heart was closed. You weren't prepared to hear it. You were full of unbelief, and you didn't understand it. You didn't make any effort to try to understand it. Those are people that come to church three times a year, and then they want a personal counseling session with the pastor to explain the Bible to them. Okay? No effort on their part. They haven't prepared their heart. They haven't tried to understand it. Okay, and the Lord says people like that are easy pickings for the devil. God just told you that if you are not preparing your heart to receive the word of God, your heart is closed up and, and you're not making any effort to try to understand what's happening. When God sows his word, the devil going to snatch it right out your heart. That, that's the married couple that just heard a sermon about marriage. And before they get their behinds on the seat of their car, they're arguing again. You know why? Because they didn't bit more, their hearts were a bit more ready to receive that word. They didn't want to hear what the Lord had to say about marriage. Their hearts, their hearts were all, and their minds were already made up. Already made up, already closed, already decided. Okay? That's your heart. That's not God. Because his words got tremendous potential, but it's unrealized potential as long as it stays in seed form. And if your heart doesn't have any understanding and you don't make any effort, to try to get some understanding, the, Bob, the Lord told you, you are easy pickings for the devil. He's going to just, just snatch it right out. That's not God. That's your hard heart. To, to give you a real life analogy, that's a dirt that hasn't been prepared to receive soil in a garden. 
Dirt that looks like that is very dry. It's also kind of a, a chalky substance. And many times it's kind of light brown. It's chalky, it's light brown, and it's just not good dirt for planting because it's dry, it's dried up, it's tired. It can't receive seed. That's what the heart is like when, when, when you haven't prepared it to receive the Word of God. So you know what that looks like in real life. That's what that looks like. And if you've ever tried to plant anything, you know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like trying to plant in soil that's not ready for seed. It just doesn't happen. It's just frustrating. Okay? So let's look at group number two. Okay, group number two, I'm still in Matthew. Uh, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. So their initial reaction is to receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Oh my goodness. Let's read that in Mark. The Lord said, Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble, excuse me, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Luke. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. Good God Almighty. So the Lord told you that second group of people, when they hear the word, the the word of God in seed form with enormous potential. When they hear the word, um, they, the, the rocky ground people, they're joyful when they first hear it, but they don't have any root, meaning it doesn't really get way down in there the same way you've got to be, be sure those seeds get way down in the soil. You cannot plant seeds just like on the top soil and think they're going to take hold. You got to plant them way down so they can take root. And the Lord said they have no root. What does that mean? That means that their heart is not actually rooted in God and his kingdom. It's just surface stuff. That's why, you know, you can shout and rejoice and, and, and have that good reaction in church. But then when it's time to pay tithes or it's time to be committed or it's time to make a sacrifice, or it's time to, to do all of that, then people like that, they just go away. They believe for a while, says the Lord, but in a time of testing. Now the Lord just told you there's going to be testing. In Mark, he said, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So in other words, those are people that are all happy when they first hear it, but then Trouble is going to rise in your life. The devil is going to resist you, and people are going to resist you too. And sometimes you just have a hard way to go trying to follow the path of God. And when some people, when they see that, they're going to be like, oh, oh, I didn't know it was going to be all this, so never mind. <laughs> they're not going to continue in the word because you will get persecuted. If you take a stand on what God says, the devil's going to hate you, and wicked people are going to hate you, and people that hate God are going to hate you. If you take a stand on what God says, you can count on that. And so the Lord said the rocky places, the rocky ground people are people that they, 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 they're happy when they first start out. But as soon as they get in some testing, as soon as they get in some trouble, as soon as they get in some persecution, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa I didn't know it was going to be all this. Because they're not deeply rooted enough in God. Their hearts don't have a root in God and his kingdom enough for them to hang in there through the tough times. The real life analogy is what I told you is like, like the Lord said, trying to plant seeds in rocky ground or topsoil. You can't just lay the seed down on the topsoil. You got to make sure the seed goes way down, deep down, so it can take root. Okay, that's the second group of people. Both times, it's your heart that's the issue, not the seed of the word. Okay, let's look at the third group. Uh, I'm in Mark, third group. Um, still others, uh, Mark uh, 4, 18. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Let's read that out of Luke. 
Uh, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Let's read that in Matthew. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, make it an unfruitful. Good God Almighty. How much more plain can the Lord state that? What he said was, so if you're among the thorny group, those are people that hear the word of God, but as life goes on, they are choked by life's worries. What are life's worries? Just the busyness of life. Just the stuff that comes along with women. Not with women. With living. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was not a Freudian slip. Not the stuff that comes along with women. The stuff that comes along with living. The things that come along with living. Okay? Like uh, worry. That's why I was trying to say worries and living and not saying women. So anyway, uh, life's worries. For example, uh, laundry. For example, taking out the garbage, which I have to do tonight. <laughs> but anyway, uh, taking out the garbage, uh, washing dishes, uh, paying bills, uh, getting up and going to work. Uh, let's say you have uh, 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 something's wrong with your toilet. Let's say something's wrong with your, with your furnace in your apartment. Let's say the heat won't come out at all. Or let's say it's hot like it is now. Let's say your air won't come on. You got no air. Uh, Let's say uh, you mow your own grass and your lawnmower breaks down. Let's say it's during the winter and you got to shovel that driveway. You got to shovel and you got to put some salt down so you can melt the ice. Okay? That's going to happen to you whether you're saved or not. That don't have nothing to do with being saved. That just come along with living. What about going through the stage of life? What about going through puberty? What about when you go from being a little kid to being a young adult? You make that change from being a little kid to being capable of sexual reproduction. What about going to college? What about moving away from your parents? What about transitioning to a new job? What about hidden midlife? What if you're not a youth anymore? What about hidden old age? All those transitions of life, if you live long enough, all that stuff's going to happen to you whether you saved or not. It don't have nothing to do with whether or not you saved. It comes along with living. So the Lord said life's worries. There are just things that come along with women living. <laughs> Things that come along with living that are going to worry us. I keep trying to put the W on it. And I keep coming up with living. I mean living and worries. The, thing that, the things that come along with living are going to continue to worry us and plague us. Just stuff we have to deal with. And then he says, riches and pleasures. And in Luke he says, they don't mature. I want to go back to Mark when he says, the words that it's like the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other other things come in and choke the word. Uh, yeah. So what is the Lord saying there? The Lord is saying there that money can deceive you, and other pleasures can other pleasures can deceive you. How does money deceive you? Well, when you get money, money can make you feel like you don't need God. That's one of the first and easiest things that money can do in your life. Is if you have it. All of a sudden, because uh, it opens every door. The Bible says that money answers all things. So if there's a thing that you want, if you got money, you can have it. Okay? So it can deceive you into thinking that you don't need God. Okay? And that's one of the first things that money can actually do. So the Lord says the deceitfulness of wealth. So in other words, if you have spent your life building up your financial portfolio and you have a sizable asset base, that can trick you. And so sometimes when people get to those points, they stop studying the word, they stop coming to church, they stop worshiping, they stop giving God the glory because they think it's by their own hand. Mm. Okay? And then it says desires for other things that come in and choke the word. So in other words, these other things come in your heart. When, when you were focused on God and God was a priority, you can bear fruit for God. But now that you got money, now you got some other desires coming in, now they're going to come in and choke that word right out your heart. It's not going to bear fruit. So let's look at the last group because that's where the key is in the last group. In Luke, uh, Luke 8.15, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. 
uh, Mark 4.20. Others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Matthew 13.23 But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what was sown. My, my, my. So the Lord says that if you got a heart, what's a noble and good heart? A heart that is prepared to receive the word of God that's coming to you in seed form with all the potential in it. So your heart is like that rich, deep black soil where the seeds can go deep and take root because there's nourishment there. That's when you've prepared your heart. That's when you've allowed God to take out all the stones of unbelief. Take out all that, 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 that light brown, chalky top dirt where nothing can grow in. Bitterness, unforgiveness, shallowness, pettiness, where you've allowed that to be scooped out and now you've got a good and noble heart that can receive the word. That's your heart. That's not the seed of the word of God. That's not God. That's your heart. Okay? And then it says, who hear the word, retain it. In Luke, hear the word, retain it. That means you got to hold on to it once you hear it. And then it says, and by persevering, produce a crop. How much more plainly can the Lord say that? You got to hear it, you got to retain it, and then you got to stay with it long enough to produce a crop. That's your heart. Okay? And Mark says, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Then finally, we get to the 30, 60, 100 fold. How does that work? Here's how. It's based on your level of development. God gives it to you in seed form. But you've got to know how to make that word turn over for you 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. It has to do with your level of development, not the seed itself. Not manna from the sky, not slot machines, not God playing favorites. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at some practical examples and you can see what I mean better. Practical example number one. Money itself. If I gave people that are listening to me a dollar, some of y'all would come back with a dollar and ten cents. Some of y'all would come back with a dollar and fifty cents. Some of y'all would come back with two dollars. You double your money. Some of y'all would come back a dollar and ten cents in debt. Some of you would come back a dollar fifty cents in debt. Some of you would come back five dollars in debt. Didn't you all get the same dollar? What's the crop? The crop has to do with whether or not you know how to multiply money, whether or not you know what to do with money. If God dropped a million dollars on you right now, if God dropped a million dollars on you right now, if God dropped a million dollars on you right now, I guarantee you in less than a year, some of the people are going to be broke. If you don't think that's true, then I want you to watch uh, any of those shows that talk about the lottery. Any of those shows that talk about lottery winners, what the lottery does, because so many of those people are broke and in worse debt. Why is that? That's not the money. That's your heart. That's your level of development. That's what you know about what to do with money. Okay? Next practical example. Children. When a man releases his seed into a woman and then a woman's egg is fertilized, that fertilized egg comes to nestle, and rest in the uterus, and then the baby grows, and it comes to term, and then the woman goes in labor and pushes the baby out, you now have a newborn. What's the difference between parents? It's not that process, because doesn't that process work the same for everybody? If a man's seed is released into a woman, and the egg gets fertilized, and the woman carries the baby to term, doesn't the baby come out? Isn't that process the same for everybody? What's the difference between parents? Difference between parents is some parents know how to take a child and take that child from a newborn baby to a fully functioning adult. And some parents don't. Just because you can make a baby, that just means your body works. Just because you can make a baby doesn't mean you know how to raise a baby. It doesn't mean you know how to take a newborn from an infant and make them a fully functioning adult. It doesn't mean you know how to do that. That's the difference between parents. That's the difference between people. You don't know what to do with the harvest of a child. You got a newborn in your hands and you don't know what to do with it. That's not God. 
And the process worked exactly the same. Seed release, fertilize the egg, baby to term, here's the baby. It's the exact same process for everybody. What's the difference between parents? Some people know how to raise children and turn them into adults, and some people don't. That's not God. Okay? If you raise your children right, you can get a hundredfold return off your children. What does that mean? That means you can get a hundred times back what you put in them. That's right. If you raise your children right, you can get a hundred times back what you put in them children. Those children will be still living in your blessing and still moving forward and prospering in life after you're dead and still blessing your name. You know how I know that's true? Because I bless my grandmother's name all the time, every day. Because I love my grandmother. My grandmother was the one who showed me Christ and got me introduced to the Lord. And here I am ministering because of her example. She took me on mission trips with her when I was 10 and under. And she took my cousin as well, had my cousin sing a song, had me read the scripture, and we prayed over the people she was ministering to because my grandmother was a missionary. And I'm seven, eight, nine, ten years old. I'm out there on mission trips with her because she sold into my life as a child. And here I am, a grown man, still ministering, giving out the word of God because of the seeds that were planted in me all the years ago when I was a little boy. See that? Because she knew what to do with a child. That's why it worked, because she knew what she was doing. Can you see it? Some people don't know what to do with children. Because your kids can give you a hundredfold return. Your kids can be serving God after you dead if you pour God into them. Okay? Finally, marriage. This is another one. And real soon, I'm going to have to do like a whole thing on this one. Marriage. A whole lot of people are walking around talking about, I want to get married. But, you know, I can't find nobody. Ain't nobody out there. Excuse me. God dropped you on a planet of seven and a half billion people. One more time. God dropped you on a planet of seven and a half billion people. And ain't there one of them good enough for you? Ain't there one of them good enough for you? Okay. Then grow old by yourself. Seven and a half billion. You talking about you can't find nobody. You're surrounded by people. That's not the problem. The problem is you don't know how to be a spouse. If you knew how to be a spouse, you could attract a spouse. Because you don't reap what you want. You reap what you sow. If you had sown into spousery, you could reap a spouse. That's right. And a whole lot of people have spouses and they don't know how to take care of them. So you lose them. If you know what to do, with a husband, if you know what to do with a wife, that marriage can give you back a hundred times what you sowed into it. If you take the word of God and you apply the word of God to your marriage and you don't let the devil snatch it out of your heart and you don't stop believing it just because of persecution or cares of this life or worries or just because you get money or whatever, and you hang in there and you retain it, that marriage, when the seed of the word of God is applied to it, can return unto you 100 times what you put into it. The problem is not God. The problem is not the word. The problem is your heart and your level of development that you don't know what to do to produce a harvest. You don't know how to stay in there, hang in there long enough with the word of God and what to do to make it turn over for you 30 or 60 or 100 times. And I gave you three practical examples with money, with children, and with marriage. That's what that looks like. Can you see it now? So the Lord is telling us in no uncertain terms that when we hear his word, it has tremendous potential, but it's in seed form. And we have to prepare our hearts to receive it. And if we don't prepare our hearts to receive it, it's not going to do us any good. Either it's not going to go deep enough, or you're going to be happy for a while, and then when trouble comes, you're going to give up on it, or you're going to let the devil snatch it out of your house, out of your heart, 
or you're going to get distracted by other things and it's going to get choked. Okay? He said, you got to have a noble and a good heart. You got to prepare that heart. You got to receive it. You got to make an effort to understand it. You got to retain it and you got to stay with it. And then as you stay with it long enough, it's going to produce a harvest. And then the 30 or 60 or 100 fold level of harvest that you get is based on you. It's based on do you know what to do with things as they are produced. If God blesses you with a child, do you know how to raise that child? If God would bless you with a spouse, would you know what to do? If you met someone that has spouse potential, would you know how to attract them? Would you know what to do? A whole lot of people think they know what to do, but they don't. That's why they're not married. You live on a planet of seven and a half billion people. I'm talking about ain't nobody out there. Nope, that's not God. That's not life. That's not people. That's you. Okay? So, I hope that was uh, uh, a good teaching for you. I hope that, because that really blessed me. Okay? And uh, I hope that helps you understand that to review is not a slot machine. It's not manna. It's not going to fall out the sky. And God is not playing favorites. But rather, it's going to come to you in seed form with a whole bunch of enormous potential that is unrealized that you are going to have to prepare your heart to receive and be sure the devil don't take it from you. Be sure that you don't let trouble or persecution uh, knock you off the path. Be sure that even if you get money or other cares or other things that it don't come in your life and choke the word out, you're going to have to retain it, understand it, persevere, and then you get a crop. That's how it works. That's how it works. It's all right there in the story that the Lord told. It's just that we got a hold of some bad teaching. And that's why we believe the other things. That's why we believe in the slot machine or the manna or the favorites. All that's wrong. The clues to interpreting it are all right there in the way the Lord taught it. Like I told you, my test as a prophet is you see if life don't bear out what I just taught you. See if life don't bear it out. Okay? See if it doesn't come to pass. See if it's not true. Test it. Test it. Okay? And see if it doesn't happen just like I taught you now. All right? All right. God bless you. That's all we have time for tonight. So that is our No More Genie uh, teaching for tonight. That really blessed me. Uh, really gave me some, some encouragement. And I hope it was encouraging to you. Uh, do I have any prayer requests? If I have any prayer requests, please uh, put them on the screen now because I'll be happy to pray for you. If I got any prayer requests. All right, no prayer requests. So I'm going to close out with a word of prayer. And, um, and then I will see you Sunday at my regular time of 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching, oh God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the explanation of your word. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit, oh God. Thank you for helping us to understand how what you give us works. So we ask you, oh God, to give us grace, give us uh, good hearts. Show us how to have good prepared hearts to receive your word. Oh God, show us how to hang in there. Show us how to fight off the devil so he doesn't snatch it. Show us how to go through the persecution and endure, oh God. Show us how to do what we need to do so that we can give birth to what you've called us to give birth to. So that we can receive our harvest and our crop, 30, 60, 100 fold. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. All right, so I will see you Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. God bless and have a good rest of your week.